They must be. Okay, great. So I see that we're um, we're recording, which is fantastic. Um, and I'll give folks just a few more minutes to come in. Um, I was thinking that I'd just give everyone maybe a minute or two in between papers just to sort of collect thoughts and questions before um, moving on to the next paper, if that's all right with everyone. I think we'll have plenty of time. Okay, and Um, also, it's not required, but if any, anyone has um, an accessible version of their paper that they'd like to post in the chat, you're welcome to do so. Uh, if, in case anyone is new, it typically only supports one voice at a time. So as audience members, we'll just sort of mute ourselves, but you're welcome to avail yourselves of the, um, the chat to share comments during the presentations or the fun emojis through the reactions down below. There's Jane's paper. Thanks, Jane. And I'm not going to share a paper partly because it's not it's sort of half ad-libbing and anyway it's mostly slides you'll but I, you'll see my slides when I when I give my talk okay great yeah and Emily I think you should be able to just sort of share screen from you know your yeah we tested it it okay. seems to work and we'll try again when it's time terrific thanks I don't have slides but the the paper is there in the, the chats <laughs> Oh my goodness. My alarm definitely beats out uh, no internet <laughs> for last minute emergencies in, in the category of last minute emergencies. Um, okay, I see um, some folks that I'm just admitting into our room now. So hopefully, um, hopefully everyone has been able to make it in. Um, all right. <clears throat> well, let's get started. It's wonderful to see you all. Um, welcome to Literary Afterlife Memorials and Relics. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce today's presenters. Um, Jane DeGay is Professor of English Literature at Leeds Trinity University in the UK and an Anglican priest. She is the author of Virginia Woolf and Christian Culture from Edinburgh University Press 2018 and Virginia Woolf's Novels and the Literary Past, Edinburgh University Press 2006. She organized the 2016 Woolf Conference and is a member of the editorial board of Woolf Studies Annual. Her latest work on Woolf includes chapters in the Oxford Handbook to Virginia Woolf, Modernist Archives a Handbook, and the Edinburgh Co Companion to Modernism, Myth and Religion. And the title of her talk today is Virginia Woolf and the Ethics of the Afterlife. Emily Copley has been presenting at Virginia Woolf conferences for the past 15 years, yay! And she's on the editorial board of Woolf Studies Annual. She lectures at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. And last year, Oxford University Press published her first book, 
Virginia Woolf and poetry. Congratulations, Emily. Stella Dean is Associate Professor of English and World Literature at the State University of New York at New Paltz, where she is a fantastic colleague and teaches courses in 20th century British literature. Her research and teaching interests include middle brow and modernist studies, periodical studies, and gender studies. She has published on World War I and interwar women writers, such as Enid Bagnold, Sylvia Townsend Warner, Elizabeth Bowen, and E.H. Young. Her current research is focused on Clements Dane, literary critic for the UK edition of Good Housekeeping in the interwar period. And her monograph in progress, Clements Dane and Good Housekeeping, Modernity and Common Reading will be published by Edinburgh University Press. I just realized I neglected to share the title of Emily's paper, which is Leslie Stevens' Wordsworth's Ethics, Virginia, Wool Virginia Stevens' 1902 edition of Wordsworth, Vanessa Bell's cover for To the Lighthouse. And the title of Stella's talk is Reading to Rescue Forgotten Lives. So um, please join me in welcoming our panelists and um, I'll turn the floor over to you, Jane. Thank you so much, Vicky. And it's just lovely to be here and to see some familiar names popping up on the screen there. Um, I don't have a slideshow, but um, I've put a link to my paper in the chat um, if, if you need to follow along. So my title is Virginia Woolf and the Ethics of the Afterlife. It's well known that Virginia Woolf regarded her novels as elegies. And she wrote in her diary in 1925, I have an idea that I will invent a new name for my books to supplant novel, a new blank by Virginia Woolf. But what? Elegy? The comment reflects the concern seen throughout her oeuvre because the death of at least one individual and the consequent mourning of those left behind is a persistent theme in her work. We can think of Rachel in The Voyage Out, Jacob in Jacob's Room, Septimus in Mrs. Dalloway, Mrs. Ramsey, Prue and Andrew into The Lighthouse, Percival in The Waves and Mrs. Parker in The Years. In her concerns about right about death, Wolf was reflecting the cultural trauma of the First World War, specifically seen in Jacob and Andrew, but also expressing her personal grief for the losses of her parents in Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey, her half-sister Stella in Rachel and Prue, and her brother Toby in Jacob, Andrew and Percival. Despite her claim that in writing to the lighthouse, she had, I quote, expressed some long felt and deeply felt emotion and laid it out to rest, Wolfe continued to write about the deaths of her family in her fiction and in her memoirs to the end of her life. Sybil Oldfield has suggested that Wolfe returned to this subject so frequently because she was using her fiction as a form of compensation for the Christian consolations that had been ruled out by her agnostic upbringing. Oldfield writes, Wolfe's deepest need of all was to give her beloved dead, her necessary ones, the immortality otherwise impossible to hope for in an unjust, indifferent, godless universe. But how precisely did Wolf understand immortality? As I aim to demonstrate in this paper, Wolf took a variety of different approaches to understanding the question of personal survival after death, because she was responding to a complex set of attitudes and beliefs in the early 20th century. The paper will explore four of these approaches. First, Christian beliefs, particularly evangelicalism. Secondly, tropes of literary immortality. Third, a belief in ghosts. And finally, Wolf's romantic appreciation of nature that influenced her spirituality and her understanding of the place of the person within the universe. So first, Christian beliefs. Although Wolf's parents were agnostic, she had plenty of exposure to Christian ideas, as Stephanie Polzell, Catherine, Kathleen Heinegger, uh, Eleanor McNeese and myself and others have shown, from her evangelical cousins, from her religious friends and from her occasional church going, including attending funerals. Wolf is therefore aware of Christian beliefs about the soul entering eternal life, including the existence of heaven as a reward for the worthy or hell as punishment for the damned. And she tests these ideas in her writing. In The Voyage Out, the only extended deathbed scene in any Wolf novel, she presents Rachel's death as a moment of ecstasy and peace for Terence, a moment when suffering is over. So much the better. This was death. It was nothing. It was to cease to breathe. This ceasing to breathe deliberately eschews any idea of the soul passing to a different place. And Wolf emphasises the emptiness of Christian consolation by stressing Terence's grief in a world that he will never see Rachel again. 
In the ensuing chapters, Walsh shows how other characters grasp at platitudes for consolation. Mrs. Thornbury imagines how, quote, the soul of the dead had passed from those windows, but she can only comprehend absence from this world, not continued existence elsewhere. Something had passed from the world, it seemed strangely empty. And although Mrs. Thornbury insists that there must be a reason, she struggles to find one. And she also has a feeling that the dead are still with us, and she says that they come to her in her dreams. Now, Wolf leaves these thoughts for the reader to ponder, but she is more critical of traditional views in her depiction of the shallower character, Evelyn Murgatroyd, who clings to conventional religion for consolation. She says, why should these things happen? Why should people suffer? I honestly believe that Rachel's in heaven. But Terence? The ellipses in this sentence suggest there's a huge gulf between beliefs and their ability to bring comfort. Evelyn asks Mr. Perrot about life after death. Do you believe that things go on, that she's still somewhere, or do you think it's a game? We crumble up to nothing when we die. I'm positive Rachel's not dead. Wolf pours scepticism on Evelyn's beliefs when she wryly notes that her companion can't agree. Mr. Perrot would have said almost anything Evelyn wanted him to say, but to assert he believed in the immortality of the soul was not in his power. Wolf critiques Christian ideas of heaven and the afterlife more fully in her essay on being ill, which, like the final chapters of The Voyage Out, meditates on serious illness. The deathbed scene was a set piece of evangelical biography, used to prove a person's piety as their soul departed from heaven. For heaven. Wolf, by contrast, uses a sickbed to complicate the dichotomy between body and soul. She suggests that contrary to hagiographies, physical illness can harm the spirit. It brings about a change that weight exposes the wastes and deserts of the soul. Wolf is non-committal about what happens after death. She says the body smashes itself to smithereens and the soul, it is said, escapes. She particularly satirises Victorian counts of heaven in a humorous sketch about emerging from anaesthetic and thinking that we hear the greeting of the deity stooping from the floor of heaven to greet us, when actually it's just the dentist saying, rinse the mouth, rinse the mouth. Wolf notes that the universal hope, heaven, immortality, seems thin when we're suffering. She dismisses a bishop's comment about heaven in the Morning Post as mere journalism, and she cynically notes that nobody would be so confident in an afterlife as to kill themselves to attain it. So rather than embracing immortality as Victorian piety would have it, a sick person, she says, is more likely to cling to life. And she also notes how being faithful doesn't save you from the pain of bereavement. And she ends with a very pious um, Victorian woman, Louise Camarchness of Waterford, crushing a plush curtain as she grasped it in her agony on the day of her husband's funeral. In her essay, Abbeys and Cathedrals, Wolfe employs a more comic mode to satirise how monuments and churches confer life on the famous departed, how immortality is to some extent decided by the institutional church on the basis of wealth and privilege, worldly values rather than spiritual ones. In her sketch of St Paul's Cathedral and Westminster Abbey, the scene is animated by the voices and activities of the dead people commemorating there. She says St Paul's is a dignified reposing room to which great statesmen and men of action retire, robed in all their splendour, to accept the thanks and applause of their fellow citizens. And in Westminster Abbey, the company seems to be in full conclave, she says. Gladstone and Disraeli are still debating. John Gay laughs. Chaucer, Spencer and Dryden listen to the services. Yet, Wolfe critiques both buildings for denying Christian tenets. St Paul's seems to be more concerned with denying death than with proclaiming how Christ had overcome death. She says, truly a heavy boss door above it has the legend that through death we pass to our joyful resurrection, but notes that this doesn't lead to heaven, but to solemn council chambers and splendid halls. Civic pride has taken the place of faith. Likewise at the Abbey, she anticipates current debates about statues by noting that some of those commemorated, particularly royalty, don't deserve the honour. Often they've been violent, they've been vicious, often it's Maybe we'll just give a moment and see if she's able to reconnect. I'm back. <laughs> I'm back. Can you hear me now? Great. Okay. 
so um, so this essay is an example of several places in Wall's work where she draws on her own knowledge of Christianity to critique the church for not living up to its principles. So in other words, Wolf could sometimes be less satirical of the concepts than the way they'd been applied. Other examples in Wolf's work show that she took the idea of immortality seriously, but she applied it to a different context. And this brings me to my second topic, literature. The context is the practice and vocation of writing. Put simply, good writing would live, poor writing deserves to be forgotten. In modern fiction, Wolf argues that fiction should reject the materialist discourse of Edwardian writing and attempt to capture, and we all know this, life or spirit, truth or reality. I argue that Wolf's rhetoric here draws on the contrast between deathly flesh and life-giving spirit that set out in the Bible, particularly in the Pauline epistles, Romans 8 and Galatians 5. And those were core to the evangelical understanding of salvation and damnation. Wolf declares Bennett, Galsworthy and Wells guilty of wasting their talents and inessentials. She says they spend immense skill and immense industry making the trivial and the transitory appear the true and the enduring. Wolf emphasizes the deathly nature of their method when she notes that their writing has an air of probability embalming the whole. By contrast, she says the novelist's vocation should be to capture life. Whether we call it life or spirit, truth or reality, this the essential thing has moved off or on and refuses to be contained any longer in such ill-fitting vestments as we provide. Literature then, and poetry in particular, has the capacity, if used well, to capture life and fend off death by embracing the numinous, the uncertain, as opposed to the fixity of doctrines. Wolf reiterates this in On Being Ill when she writes that poetry can bring a comfort the religious tracts cannot. Heaven making, she says, must be left to the imagination of the poets. When done properly, literature can convey life, and it's this that makes it a perfect form for giving life to departed loved ones. In this regard, Wolf shared Shakespeare's sensibility from Sonnet 18 that he could confer immortality on the young man, his beloved, by preserving him in verse. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, the sonnet, and this gives life to thee. This can be done because the literary text is a timeless space in which past and present coexist, so that she can revisit the past in which her loved ones were alive, recalling it in the present. As Gabrielle McIntyre notes, memory and desire play an important part in this reanimation of the past. Wolf's writing of memory, McIntyre writes, is an approach to the tangible order to which we may again connect ourselves. Wolf had a strong imaginative sense that long dead poets achieve immortality through their works and their influence. We see this in her essay reading in which she reanimates writers of the past. She says, if I looked down at my book, I could see Keats and Pope behind him and then Dryden and Sir Thomas Brown, hosts of the merging in the mass of Shakespeare, behind whom, if one peered long enough, some shapes of men in Pilgrim's Dash appeared, Chaucer perhaps, and again, who was it? some uncouth poet, scarcely able to syllable his words, and so they died away. Wolf's gathering here is of a community of writers who've influenced future generations and attained immortality through their writing. Wolf played with ideas of literary immortality in the figure of Anon, that surfaces throughout generations, in the figure of Orlando, the poet born in Shakespeare's age and still writing and still fruitful in the present, but also especially in classical Greek literature. In On Not Knowing Greek, she suggests that Greek literature echoes throughout English literature. And as she develops this point, she also draws on the Hellenistic idea that the soul is immortal. She notes, the Greeks could say as if for the first time, yet being dead, they have not died. For Wolf, classical Greek thinking was more helpful than Christian ideas. As she states at the conclusion of the essay, it is to the Greeks that we turn when we are sick of the vagueness, of the confusion, of the Christianity and its consolations of our own age. Classical Greek writing is particularly consolatory because it's honest about suffering. She says, they are more aware than we are of a ruthless fate. There is sadness at the back of life, which they did not attempt to mitigate. Wolf's understanding of the immortality of Greek literature informs her description of the collection of books in the British Museum in Jacob's Room. She says that in the British Museum, there's the brain and the brain is Plato's brain and Shakespeare. The brain is made pots and statues, 
great bulls and little jewels and crossed the river of death this way and that way incessantly, seeking some landing, now wrapping the body well for its long sleep, now laying a penny piece on the eyes, now turning the toes scrupulously to the east. Meanwhile, Plato continues his dialogue and Hamlet utters his soliloquy. Here, Wolf con contrasts funerary practices, including the provision of grave goods and the preparation of bodies for burial with the immortal words of Plato and Shakespeare figured as endless speech. Wolf identifies Plato's dialogue as the Phaedrus and it's the one in which Socrates argues that all soul is deathless. She doesn't identify it as a soliloquy from Hamlet, but equally life after death is a concern for him, so he doesn't kill himself in case he faces eternal punishment. He doesn't kill Claudius while Claudius is praying in case that sends him to heaven. Once Nautica's bribing to particularly believes herself, Wolf uses discourses of life after death to su support suggestions of literary immortality. So I'm now gonna to move to ghosts. Wolf's images of past writers continue to be heard in the present, like Plato and Shakespeare, or appearing in the present, like the parade of writers in reading, also draw on tropes of ghosts and haunting. Indeed, Orlando cries that she's been haunted by Shakespeare. Haunted ever since I was a child, she says. Many of Wolf's contemporaries believed in ghosts and spiritualism was on the rise as a result of the First World War. There's no evidence that Wolf believed in ghosts. Indeed, she was often skeptical of her be these beliefs. And there's that wonderful sketch of a Mr. Whittam who went on about spiritualism, talked about how he made tables waltz and heard phantom raps and believed it all. I thought this showed weakness and I expect he hasn't got a good head on his shoulders. Nonetheless, Wolf alluded to ghosts in her writing. In her short story, A Haunted House, a couple from centuries ago peacefully coexist with a present day couple. Their presence hinted at by opening doors or movements of the natural world, such as reflection of apples on glass or the bird in flight. And this fantasia is supported by a modernist play with time so that centuries can be overlaid and different time frames can coexist. The story prefigures the airs that move ghostlily through the empty cottage in Time Passes into the lighthouse. And perhaps Mrs. Ramsey's appearance to Lady Briscoe could also be seen as ghostly. But Wolf also used the trope of the ghost to show the impact of the past on the present could be unhelpful and that the desire to keep hold of the dead was unhealthy. When she wrote the therapeutic effect of writing about her parents into the light, how she described it as a sort of exorcism. I laid them in my mind. Here Wolf suggests that consolation is found not in imagining the dead to be still alive or still with us. Rather, it's found in um, allowing them to let go and be dead. And Mrs. Ramsey thinks that, I'm um, sorry, Lily Briscoe thinks this of Mrs. Ramsey when she says, oh, the dead, one pitied them, one brushed them aside. We can override her wishes, improve her old fashioned limited ideas. Famously, of course, in Professions for Women, Wolf spoke of the important, albeit difficult task of killing that phantom angel in the house. Finally, I turn to nature. At the close of the essay, Abbeys and Cathedrals, Wolf suggests that nature can help provide relief from the noisy animated dead commemorated in the Christian churches. She says consolation can be found in the assurance that the dead sleep and are at rest. And she finds this res respite in the old graveyards of London, where the stones have been removed and the grounds have reverted to a natural state. Here, the dead sleep in peace, proving nothing, testifying nothing, claiming nothing. They've become part of the natural world, for when the burial grounds are planted and sown, the dead flower again and spread the ground with green and elastic turf. Individual existence may have been lost, for they've given up their human rights to separate names or peculiar virtues, but nonetheless, the dead continue to exist as part of the natural world. Wolf found nature consoling, as Bonnie Kime Scott and others have shown, and she frequently presented the death of an individual in juxtaposition to a lyrical passage on the natural world. So this happens in um, um, the death of, with the death of Rachel uh, in The Voyage Out, in Time Passes, of course, which is all about nature, but interspersed by the death of individuals, in the years um, at the death of Rose Parkiter. So all of these instances suggest that the individual is subsumed into a wider general existence. Now, this doesn't always preclude the extinction of the individual. 
So Clarissa Dalloway comes closest to speculating about this when she thinks that she could survive, she says, in the trees at home, laid out like a mist between the people she knew best, who lifted her on her branches as she had seen trees lift the mist. So just to conclude then, this is a brief summary because there's so many other examples I could have brought in. However, they serve to demonstrate Wolf's intense interest in juxtaposing meditations on death and the death of characters with explorations of different concepts of continuing existence after death. Wolf doesn't present us with a consistent or worked through philosophy, but rather, and importantly, she responds imaginatively. The imagination was important for her as a way of bringing her loved ones back to life within her texts, of giving past writers new vibrancy in her essays and her literary illusions, and of figuring the natural world as a space where the individual could dissipate like the mist, but nonetheless still live on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jane. Maybe we'll take just a couple of minutes to kind of process all of this. Thank you for the deep questions. Okay, um, Emily, would you like to? Okay, hi, um, I'm going to share my screen. Can everyone see this? Yes, Vicky, someone give me a signal. Yes, yes. You can see. okay, <laughs> okay. okay, very good, very good. Um, well, I'm very glad to be here. Thanks to you all for coming. Thanks, Vicky, for chairing, um, and Stella and Jane. It's it's a pleasure to speak on a panel with you. Um, my talk is has an unwieldy title, but at least it covers the terrain. It's called Leslie Stevens' Wordsworth's Ethics, Virginia Stevens' 1902 edition of Wordsworth, and Vanessa Bell's cover for To the Lighthouse. I'm going to start with an image you are all familiar with. Whoops, how do I, there we go. Okay. Um, that is Vanessa Bell's cover for To the Lighthouse. What does it depict? Uh, everywhere, every description of it, uh, Kirkpatrick, anyone you read says, this is, this is a lighthouse. Um, and of course it, it is certainly a lighthouse. Uh, the title suggests as much and so do the waves at the bottom and the light blue color of the waves. But the central column could also be a tree. Uh, what we might see as beams of the lighthouse, we might also see as branches of a tree with, with leaves at the top. In particular, it could be the tree that Lily thinks of moving, quote, to the middle of her first painting. Or it could be the quote, line there in the center uh, that, as we know, she draws down um, her second painting. 
And of course, at the novel's end, Lily completes her painting with this central line just at the moment that Mr. Ramsey, James, and Cam arrive at the lighthouse. So the simultaneous arrivals, Lily finishing her painting, arriving at the lighthouse, find a visual equivalent in Lily's line, which could be itself lighthouse or tree or both. And what is true of Lily's line down the center is also, could also be true of Vanessa Bell's cover. Now I'm going to share an image that will be less familiar. These are the end papers of Wolfe's 1902 copy of the complete poetical works of William Wordsworth. Along with most of the other books uh, of Leonard and Virginia Woolf that survived, this is held at Washington State uh, University Library in Pullman, Washington. Here we see a drawing of three trees and lattice work towards the bottom, maybe a gate or a balcony. There's some sort of frame as though the trees are seen through a window or maybe two windows because there's this sort of dividing line uh, hugging the end papers at the middle. Maybe, so, okay. The medium looks like crayon. This is the only book I know of in the Wolf Library so passionately marked up. I visited uh, in 2009, December 2009, a long time ago now. And when I saw these end papers, I almost shrieked in the reading room because the tree in the middle strikingly resembles the cover of To the Lighthouse. But it has taken me this long, 12 years, to try to figure out what that similarity means. And I, I don't have all the answers. And this is an attempt to tell you what I, what I have figured out. So here, we can compare the images that look so similar. We see uh, a thick central column in both with a few aspiring black lines at the top and a scalloped border, the, the top of the tree, the top of the whole uh, design for the cover. There are many unknowns about, well, both these drawings, particularly the, the drawings in the Wordsworth. So for the rest of the talk, I will trace the provenance of the, of the edition of Wordsworth um, as much as I have been able to figure out to suggest what this similarity means. It is not only the end papers of the Wordsworth that have been colored upon. Here we see also the front piece down um, and we see one of the many book plates of Virginia Stephen, ABS, her initials, and uh, 19 uh, is printed there, inviting her to fill out the date. She has written in 03, 1903. Uh, there, she used many book plates. Um, Diane Gillespie has published on those many book plates. Uh, and she's also published on uh, the relation between Vanessa Bell's art and Wolf's writing um, in the Sisters Arts. So I believe it was Virginia Stephen herself who wrote 03, but then clearly someone uh, colored this page, drew a black border around the book plate and these, these black lines dividing this page into panels. Um, and it is colored uh, in an intense purple, green, and blue. The Wordsworth edition itself, this is the Wordsworth edition. This is not, these are images from from Google Books. These are not, this is not from Wolf's copy, but it looks just the same. This is the title page. Um, the 1902, this 1902 edition was a reprint of an 1888 edition by Macmillan, um, not the first reprint of that 1888 edition. 
And the introduction was by John Morley, who was an essayist and uh, an MP and a close friend of Leslie Stephen. So I would guess that Virginia Stephen received this book as a gift from her father, maybe for her 21st uh, birthday, 1903. She did not acquire poetry books of her own accord until after the death of her father and then especially after the death of Toby, her brother in 1906. I'm going to skip a few slides here. Okay. Leslie Stephen's favorite poet was Wordsworth and he particularly appreciated Wordsworth when he was grieving. He said he repeatedly wrote that Wordsworth was the only poet who could comfort him when he was in mourning. Um, here are several quotes, uh, but I'll read you just the middle one from Wordsworth's Ethics. He writes here, Wordsworth's favorite lesson is the possibility of turning grief and disappointment into account. He teaches in many forms the necessity of transmuting sorrow into strength. Wordsworth is the only poet who will bear reading in times of distress. Leslie Stephen wrote this essay while he was grieving uh, for his first wife, Minna Thackeray. In his grief for his second wife, Julia Stephen, he wrote the mausoleum book uh, in which he returns to that essay on Wordsworth. The mausoleum book occupied a similar place in Stephen's life as Wordsworth's ethics. Both were written to comfort the widower as he mourned. Like the mausoleum book, To the Lighthouse is a memorial volume for Julia Stephen, a transmuting of sorrow into strength. And like her father, Wolfe looked to Wordsworth in her grief. She alludes to Wordsworth several times into the lighthouse. Um, I have slides detailing those allusions, but I'm going to skip over them because I have published on them already uh, in my book, Wolf and Poetry. Um, and also Jane, uh, Jane DeGay has written extensively on Wolf's allusions to Wordsworth um, in Virginia Woolf and the Literary Past. So you will just have to remember or accept that To the Lighthouse has a textual uh, debt to Wordsworth, an extensive textual debt to Wordsworth. And that this debt, this textual debt to Wordsworth honors both Leslie and Julia Stephen. So now what of the novel's debt to this particular copy of Wordsworth? What we see here is that before somebody colored uh, the front paste down, Wolf inscribed the book to somebody. I've rendered the image in black and white so it's a little easier to make out her inscription. Um, you can see at the top, it says from Virginia. And then the bottom part is much harder to make out. It looks to, like it says, nurse, whom, or maybe whom, and then May, and then the date looks like 1915, possibly 1913. Um, it would be really nice if what I read as nurse really said Nessa, but I, I don't think it does. That would, that would be really helpful if it said Nessa, but I, but it really looks like nurse to me. Um, so many unknowns here. Um, by 1913, Wolf had had many nurses from uh, previous breakdowns and starting in April, 1913, she again deteriorated. And then in May, 1915, she had another breakdown and needed four nurses to care for her. There is little textual record of these periods of Wolf's life. So this inscription, whether it is 1913 or 1915, is unusual. 
I have <laughs> tried various ways of identifying the nurses who cared for Wolf and I, I have turned up nothing. Um, maybe we cannot know um, whom the nurse was, uh, who the nurse was to whom Wolf uh, gave this book. Maybe we cannot know why the nurse didn't take the book or if she took it, why she gave it back because it ends up in Wolf's library. Maybe inscribing the book was a sign of Wolf's esteem for Wordsworth, a way of highly valuing him. Here, you will like this, this poet I love. Um, or perhaps uh, inscribing this book was a sign of, her, of recovery. Um, she was well enough to, to do this. Um, maybe inscribing the book was a sort of apology um, to a nurse with whom she had been violent. We know that she was with, with some nurses. Um, perhaps all we can say with certainty is that during a personally painful time, Wolf looked to Wordsworth as her father had done at similar times in his own life. At any, in any event, the book ends up back in Wolf's library. I think the sketches are by Vanessa Bell, because she was the serious and prolific artist in the family and aspects of the sketches abound in, in her work. The scalloping, the cross hatching, uh, trees. She did many paintings of trees. The symmetry, you see you know, the three trees, one in the middle. Vanessa Bell often uh, pursued symmetry. I am not sure about the hand of the, who colored around the book plate because that hand is less controlled. Vanessa Bell was given to um, black X's as a pattern, um, but it's possible one of her children was imitating her. Um, maybe Angelica, who was the only one of her three children born after 1913. That is the only one able to color over this inscription. Children do, of course, often copy the designs they see around them. Maybe one of, maybe it was Angelica who initiated the defacement of the Wordsworth volume, and then Vanessa Bell kept going. Um, here's an example of a painting of Vanessa's of a central tree. Tree symmetry. Um, just a minute, I'm gonna have some water just. In placing trees at the center of a composition, Vanessa Bell was following the example of Cezanne. Here are three Cezanne paintings that do just that. And of course, Roger Fry writes in his book, Cezanne, published in 1927, just before, um, just around the time of The Lighthouse, published by the Hogarth Press. He writes about the, quote, central line of the painting. And uh, this, this phrase, the central line of the painting and these examples of Cezanne's central lines down his paintings uh, were of course an influence on Wolf's structuring of To the Lighthouse with the, the two blocks joined by a corridor and Lily's line down the center of her painting, moving the tree to the middle. Here, I will try to wrap it all up. I cannot know for sure uh, I believe, uh, who did the sketch of the trees or when. I think and I hope that the sketch predates to the lighthouse and that the sketch was a visual source for both Wolf and Bell. That is a source for both the novel and its cover. The sketch bears a strong resemblance to Lily's finished painting. We read, quote, she would paint that picture now. There was the wall, the hedge, the tree. And later, there was something, something she remembered in the relations of those lines, cutting across, slicing down, and in the mass of the hedge with its green cave of blues and browns. So perhaps this sketch is a source for Lily's uh, finished painting. 
As for the cover, Vanessa Bell had not read to the lighthouse when she designed the cover, but she might have looked at this edition of Wordsworth. Maybe the sketch gave her an idea of how the lighthouse could look like a tree. Maybe Wolf suggested to her sister that she take this sketch in the Wordsworth as a model for the cover. Maybe the sketch was deliberate practice for the cover. One can imagine all sorts of scenarios in which the sisters discuss Wolf's novel in progress, their childhood, their parents, and Wordsworth. The sisters, like their father, turn to Wordsworth to help them make beautiful and lasting art that honors the dead. Wolf praised her sister's cover thus in a letter to her. Privately, I thought it lovely, but I was too much dashed by your letter to say so. Your style is unique because so truthful and therefore it upsets one completely. Lovely, unique, truthful and upsetting, perhaps that is all one can say with certainty about the sketch in Wolf's Wordsworth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. Why don't we take um, perhaps a couple of minutes to just gather our thoughts. Hey, Stella. I'll turn things over to you and reading to rescue forgotten lives. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm just going to get my screen sharing set up here. Okay. Thank you everyone for coming today. And wow, I've really enjoyed those first two papers. Uh, I have changed my title just slightly, uh, Reading to Rescue Forgotten Lives, The Common Reader and the Literary Fragment. Uh, and there's a link there to the paper, which you probably saw. <clears throat> In the first decades of the 20th century, an improved technology for printing and distributing books brought in its wake complaints about the overproduction of books. The consensus was that with so many books to read and so much pressure on reviewers to evaluate books quickly, 
promising authors who were likely never to come to the attention of readers and book, good books were bound to fall into oblivion. Oops, I just realized I don't have my slide on the first page. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> um, journalistic commentaries are, commentaries are legion. Wolf's Reviewing, 1939, comes readily to mind, documenting a dysfunctional because commercially driven mechanism for advertising and reviewing new books. In How Should One Read a Book in 1926, Wolf figures the reviewer as the patron of a shooting gallery with only one second in which to load and aim and shoot at the books that pass in review. The pressures of time and of too many books effectively make the journalist review hit or miss. Good housekeeping critic Clemence Dane likewise faults the reviewer and her essay, Fragments That Remain. You gotta do this with two-handedly. Obliquely calls our attention to another pitfall in the reviewer's job that her contract with one or more weekly or monthly periodicals makes the reviewer more likely to follow an approved formula than to go out on a limb to champion innovation. Authors were not the only parties incurring injury and neglect. Common readers were also badly served by published reviews. Classical scholar Gilbert Norwood's Too Many Books, appearing in the London Mercury, provides a particularly penetrating scrutiny of this mechanism and its effect on readers. Once social creatures who used books to bond with others, says Norwood, readers now replicate the competitive impulses of the marketplace as they seek to position themselves in the know and elbow fellow readers out of the rapid currents of book talk. In response to this dysfunctional book culture, Wolf and Dane sought to protect the common reader's integrity, her disinterested enjoyment and evaluation of literature, and even strengthen her responsibilities within this competitive environment. Both critics identify the literary fragment and related unpublished, unpublished, and unfinished genres as literary forms particularly suited to the disinterested and far-ranging reader. Both encourage the common reader to gather, in Dane's words, the fragments that remained after professional critics had taken their fill. Both Dane and Wolf argue that the fragment encourages ethical forms of readerly attention, from the activism of the fragment finder to the artistry of the silhouette artist, that in the early 20th century climate of book production and distribution could no longer be provided by the reviewer. In what follows, I will explore how and why the literary fragment and the related genres, such as the memoir, uh, in the hands of the common reader graduates from a regrettable, incomplete text to a precious, though underappreciated form. The first ethical form of readerly attention solicited by the fragment arises from its status as an underappreciated but valuable literary object. Wolf and Dane both figure the reader rescuing the author of the fragment or the dusty memoir from an untimely death. In Wolf's The Lives of the Obscure, the reader who visits an obsolete library and chooses to take an obscure life off the shelf is figured as a deliverer advancing with lights across the waste of years to the rescue of some stranded ghost who seeks the divine relief of communication. The earnest amateur reader of fragments that remain offers similar relief, this time to an author cut down in the prime of life as Dane solicits readers sympathy for the ghost of Christopher Marlowe, tortured from beyond his grave as a rival completes his fragment, Hero and Leander. It is not hard to see why the fragment disparaged by professional critics might provide an opportunity for the common reader to shine. And yet the situation of the fragment in a hierarchy of literary genres only begins to reveal its potential. Especially important are the reasons for its transformation in this period from a regrettable remains to an object of particular beauty in its own right. So the history of the fragment, the Oxford English Dictionary dates from the early 17th century, the first uses of fragment meaning an extant portion of a writing or composition, which as a whole is lost. Also a portion of a work left uncompleted by its author. And its usage appears to have slighted or depreciated the fragment, especially relative to a regretted or unavailable whole. 
so in these two in these two sections, uh, the New Atlantis is called only a fragment, and there's a reference in the second uh, OED citation to Cowley's unfinished fragment. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the fragment took on a range of new meanings related to the experience of modernity, from the snatches of landscape viewed from a speeding automobile, to the fragmentation of a once unified reading public, to the juxtaposition of scraps on the front page of a daily paper, to the remnants of Sappho's poetry on recently, recently unearthed Egyptian parchment. Here is Wolf on Orlando's fragmented perception in 1928 as she drives her car through the West End shopping district. Streets widened and narrowed, long vistas steadily shrunk together. Here was a market, here a funeral, here a procession with banners upon which was written Ra, Un, but what else? Meat was very red, butchers stood at the door. Women almost had their heels sliced off. And more of in, that was over a porch. A woman looked out of a bedroom window, profoundly contemplative and very still. Apple John and apple bed under it. Nothing could be seen whole or red from start to finish. What was seen begun like two friends starting to meet each other across the street was never seen ended. After 20 minutes, the body and mind were like scraps of torn paper tumbling from a sack. Here it is the perceivers, Orlando's inability to pay full attention to a whole scene that creates what I will call the regrettable fragment. Both the density of urban phenomena and the speed at which Orlando travels means that objects, words, and people cannot be seen whole. Fragmentation tears what had been entire. <clears throat> As we will see, both Dane and Wolf elsewhere invert key terms in the concept of a regrettable fragment, that is, a perceiver's inability to pay full attention to a whole scene. They construct a reader who pays full attention to a precious fragment or full attention to a desirable part. Artists and writers seized on the possibilities of the fragment for modernist aesthetics, but the fragment was also popular. It had enjoyed a new vogue since at least 1896, when Oxford archaeologists working in Egypt discovered a torrent of papyri, including fragments of poems by Sappho. Reports and popularization of these archaeological discoveries, including publications and lectures based on them, gripped the public imagination, infiltrating popular novels and music hall songs, newspaper reports, and the Times Book of the Week. Museums began to foreground the fragment as they removed neoclassical restorations of ancient Greek sculpture. Part three, from regrettable fragmentation to precious remains. The next several quotations demonstrate Wolf's and Dane's passage from an understanding of the fragment as a regrettable lack to its conception as a text of, or art object valued in itself. This first example from Wolf's Taylor's and Edgeworth's, first published in 1924, captures both the fragmentary qualities of the memoir and their peculiar appeal to the reader's pathos. One would conclude that human beings were happy, endowed with such blindness to fate, so indefatigable an interest in their own activities, were it not for those sudden and astonishing apparitions staring in at us, all taut and pale in their determination never to be forgotten, Men who have just missed fame, men who have passionately desired redress, men like Hayden and Mark Pattison and the Reverend Blanco White. And in the whole world, there is probably but one person who looks up for a moment and tries to interpret the menacing face, the furious beckoning fist, before in the multitude of human affairs, fragments of faces, echoes of voices, flying coattails and bonnet strings disappearing down the shrubbery walks, one's attention is distracted forever. The memoir is composite of fragments when they reach the reader because a multitude of human affairs claim the reader's attention. In fact, her distracted attention plays a significant role in turning the full life of the memoir subjects, their passionate desires, into mere fragments of faces and so on. In this instance, the reader is unlikely to breathe new life into the obscure dead. In the case of this passage from the lives of the obscure, then both the multitude of lives 
and what Wolf calls the race of life mean that the reader receives the text as a regrettable fragment. Nonetheless, the reader does hear the text plea never to be forgotten. This plea represents a door between the obscure dead and the reader that has been left open a crack. For if the fragmentation of the memoir as written lives leaves only a small chance that they will make their voices heard, paradoxically, this same fragmentation presents an opportunity for a common reader to stray from the herd and in effect resuscitate this voice from the dead. In the whole world, there is probably but one person, et cetera, et cetera. Only the unhurried, non-professional reader, the reader who has no review deadline to meet, will have the time and the stamina to undertake this rescue. Dane gives a shout out to this non-professional reader in Fragments That Remain in the context of her review of Comrade's last fragment, Suspense, which was published just at the time of, of this essay in 1926. She writes, it is a pity to sneer at the earnest amateur. It is he, not the professional man or woman of letters who keeps good books alive. This was the case for Comrade, Dane maintains. She adds, it was the queer devotion, an ethical intervention that led a thousand amateur, earnest amateurs to recognize that in the Rover, Comrade was striking off on a new path, a path now confirmed with the publication of Suspense. Dane figures Comrade's readers as fragment finders, activist common readers who searched through last year's harvest for the golden fragments of a beloved author's work that remain. She explicitly signals this idea through the essay title and epigraph pointing us to Matthew chapter 14, verse 20, the gist of which is, as you see on this slide, even after everyone has been fed, the fragments that remain are precious and are gathered by the disciples of Jesus. Particularly interesting to us is the way these definitions bypass the idea of the fragment as a regrettable and partial piece and instead highlight the fragment as a precious remains that elicits from certain non-professional readers the heightened appreciation we feel when we know we have only a little of something good. Thus, even when Dane refers to the fragment as something cut off from a greater whole, she emphasizes its value. Quote, would the Venus of Milo still be beauty if she had her arms? Here, the fragment gains a poignant beauty by museum visitors' awareness of something lost. <clears throat> Let's consider one last fragment to see its transformation from regrettable part to freestanding objet d'art, the silhouette of Mrs. Edgeworth in The Lives of the Obscure. Remember that Wolfe is reading Edgeworth's husband Richard's memoirs, uh, and they were, the, of course, the parents of Mariah Edgeworth, the novelist Mariah Edgeworth. Wolfe has no direct access to Mrs. Edgeworth herself. Yet Richard's copious words provide the thick substance from which an artist may sculpt the separate portrait of his wife. This imaginative act is the only way to bring Mrs. Edgeworth to life and intuit her feelings. The common reader's ethical attention here does more than rescue an obscure figure crying out to be heard. She must construct this figure from an undistinguished mass, or to use Wolf's metaphor, also drawn from the visual arts, the memoir reader cuts a silhouette on Mrs. of Mrs. Edgeworth from the broad disc of her husband's interminable chatter. Wish I had written that sentence. Upon no other background could we realize so clearly the sharp fragment of his first wife, Wolf adds. As we have seen, the when professional reviewers bypass the fragment as an unfinished, unconventional, unsaleable book, earnest amateur readers whose integrity lies in their disinterested reading keep such texts in circulation. But if the common reader rescues the fragment from oblivion, the fragment rescues the reader in return. The fragment engages readers social and critical functions, strengthening their ability on the one hand to break off from the herd and on the other to resist the authoritative judgments 
of the furred and gowned authorities who risk swamping the judgments of the novice reader in how should one read a book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stella. <clears throat> um, so we now have time for questions. Some folks may be gathering last thoughts on Stella's paper. Um, so uh, we have Riley as our chat monitor. Um, we can share questions in the chat. If you have a question, feel free to use the hand raise function. Can I jump in with a question, Vicki? Yeah, go for it, Ben. OK, thank you. And I apologize if um, my question gives away that I missed the first five minutes of Jane's talk. So if, <laughs> if Jane has already covered this or addressed this at the beginning of her talk, I do apologize. Um, Stella's presentation actually, I think, prompts this question, um, if only because she, she invokes the Common Reader uh, project, the, the double volume project of Wolf. Um, and then Emily's uh, presentation, I think, in some ways performed uh, an answer to the question I'm, I'm sort of thinking about. And uh, and if I can articulate that succinctly, I will try right now. Um, I'm wondering if these reflections on afterlives, on remains, on fragments, has some implications for how we think of the work of literary criticism or literary research as also sort of engaging um, in some of these projects of dealing, dealing with <laughs> the dead, so to speak, because I think in some ways e each of the three papers uh, kind of addresses that. And uh, I, this is not an, a disinterested uh, question either, since I write a bit about this in the sensuous pedagogies uh, of Virginia Woolf and D.H. Lawrence, that, that death is everywhere in the common readers and is often the prompt for many of the essays that appear in those volumes. But aside from that self-promotion, I was just kind of curious what the panel thinks uh, about, um, about the work of the critic, the work of the researcher, uh, and if there are implications for how you think of those roles given, given the projects that you just presented. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind starting. Thank you for, for that question. Uh, you know, ironically, because I started the paper with with too many books, um, the problem of, of too many books being being published in, in the era in which Dane and, and Wolf are, are writing. Uh, I think this is true for Wolf, but it's it's definitely true for Dane. The book essay is usually an occasion for the literary critic to resuscitate, you know, things written centuries ago and put them in dialogue with the recently published books. So it's a really neat instance. So in, in this essay of the fragments that remain, you know, there's there's Christopher Marlowe, there's the Fairy Queen, and she she talks about the excerpt of the of the River Thames. And she delights in kind of proliferating these examples. And it really, I think it's very important to her, in fact, to kind of keep alive those classical texts as a way for her readers to make sense of new books and put them in literary tradition. So yeah, I, I completely agree with with your with your premise. Can I follow that? I think this, that's such a, a, a great question and I agree with what you said. And I was also thinking about Wolf having, feeling differently about writers who were still alive, the way she thinks about ones who are dead. And I'm sure you, Ben, you know the uh, the quote about D.H. Lawrence, you know, D.H. Lawrence dies and she goes, oh, um, I can't believe such a great writer was alive when I was writing. And yet she, I must read him sometime. And yet she'd actually reviewed him. <laughs> So whether there's a sort of difference between contemporaries who could be something of a threat because you don't know what they're going to come out with next and dead writers who you can sort of somehow claim and, and, and you can sort of take the, 
the credit for resuscitating them. And I think there's a lot that happens there, especially in room of one's own. You know, when she's talking about people, um, she sees it obscure, but actually they're not really that that she's sort of saying they are. So, you know, George Eliot, oh, you know, she, she was such a, a suffering woman writer and, you know, I'm going to have to rescue her and reclaim her. So I think there's a certain rhetoric that Wolf is using between those. And I suppose it touches interestingly on ethical implications that we often have when, you know, we're writing about writers who are still alive and the sort of considerations you've got there and writers such as Wolf who are now sort of receding into the past, um, you know, when we don't have people that we might offend by what we say about her. So those, those are my thoughts. Can I just jump in there, Vicky? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, no, I think it's interesting because um, Ben and Shiloh and Amy and I, the, the Wolf co-conspirators who do the salons, we've talked about this for a couple of years now. Um, it's it's been one of my hobby horses uh, for for a while. The idea that for for many many years basically from the 1980s onward there was this um literary criticism was not about illuminating the work it was about quite the opposite um you know when it was you know deconstruction at its most odious was about sort of uh doing the opposite of what we're talking about here and that wolf seems to be looking at the work of the dead in an almost dare I say religious way, in a way of sort of, you know, elevating, lifting up, putting on a pedestal. And there was something, a glorification of the work in some way, which is interesting. And the idea of possibly returning to that kind of um, literary criticism, I I think it holds a great deal of appeal, um, particularly when we're fighting, you know, the tides of ignorance and stupidity and all the other things that are in the way of people coming to great literature um, to sort of return to that in a weird way, almost holy aspect of, I say this as a decidedly lapsed Catholic, uh, as the almost holy aspect of returning to a kind of criticism that is about exaltation and about um, praise. So I think it's kind of interesting to think about death and religion and literary criticism and all these things all these things are stirred up in my mind now that uh, I've listened to these three papers. So a lot to think about. Thank you. I just wanted to give the panelists a chance to respond if they like. And um, and then I see a question from Pat in the chat. So I'll turn to Pat. Well, well, Wolf um, does not fall into the, the trap that Dane does, which is that Dane constantly evoke Shakespeare, right? He's he's just this touch tone. She's so kind of typical, I think, of, of her generation in that way. But yes, it is this sort of glorification of writers who are long dead, but it's also a kind of shortcut to something that everyone will agree upon. Um, Pat, do you want to uh, raise your question from from the chat about or scraps fragments. Should I read this from the chat here? Uh, Pat, there might be a, a mute button at the bottom okay. that looks like a microphone that'll allow you to. Uh, let's see. Stella, why don't you go ahead and read? Stella, read very question. interesting paper. How do you view the scraps, orts, and fragments? of Emily's paper. And then the next question is for Emily, are you extending the notion of the critic as a precious fragment? So the scraps, orts, and fragments, remind me what, what that came from? Pat, I think is still muted. But, yeah, but between Emily the acts, do it I think. Too, yeah. Between the acts. Yeah. Well, they would be, um, you know, they, I they seem to me to be more kind of an instance of the, uh, maybe not the, the regrettable fragment exactly, but that experience of, of modernity, of, of uh, juxtaposition of things that don't go together or things being kind of jumbled together. Uh, I guess, you know, without, without going back a little bit more to that text, because I do think I remember it, uh, or that passage in the text, 
it doesn't seem to me to be an opportunity to resuscitate something that could become valorized as, as a text, as a standalone text. So it seems to be more belong to that other, other idea of fragmentation, which is that kind of, uh, you know, um, jumbled up experience of modernity, if you will. Can I be heard? Yes, now we yes. Oh, we just we just lost you. We had you for a moment there, Pat. I just wanted to um, indicate that um, Emily's paper, in my mind, reanimates um, the notion of the precious fragment that you were talking about, Stella Dean. You know, where she puts together various uh, kinds of images and thinking and writing um, to create something new. And I just wondered what Emily's view of the fragment is as, as you explained it. I'm, I'm interested in your talking to each other actually. Thank you. Um, thanks Pat. Uh... Thanks everyone. And thank you, Stella and Jane for your papers. I have to say I am frustrated by my inability to solve the mystery of my, I, I gave you a fragment of a story. I mean, a story with many missing pieces and I aesthetically, I don't like that. I want the answers. I wish I had the solution. I wish I knew you know, is it 1913 or 1915? Is it Nurse or Nessa? I don't find that the mysteries here uh, aesthetically satisfying um, because it's not a work of art. I mean, I mean, the sketch is a work of art, but the story I'm trying to tell is not, um, I'm trying to tell a, a coherent narrative. I'm not trying to create a sort of mysterious vignette. So the genre, it's like what genre, in what genre does a fragment work? In what genre is a fragment satisfying? Um, I find the genre that I'm trying to write, uh, I find a fragment not satisfying in this genre. Um, there you go. But, but you're a modernist critic and we don't always seek resolution. <laughs> Maybe I'm a bad modernist. Maybe I'm a romantic writing about modernism. Right, and presumably your attention to the fragment the fragments that you showed us, right? The the book plate and the uh, not really the illustration of the cover, but the the coloring within within her edition of Wordsworth. Presumably, your attention to those, admittedly, they are fragments. You you haven't yet been able to stitch them in a whole narrative, but you are attending to them as integral entities that everyone can now pay further attention to. Um, so I think that I hadn't thought of it, Pat. That's quite brilliant. But I think you you really do illustrate the idea of the fragment as something that is capable of being resuscitated for a freestanding object, um, which which doesn't which doesn't impede its connections to other things down the road. Um, Varsha has a question that I think is related here about gender um, and fragments. Varsha, do you want to step in? Sure, I'll just read it out. I enjoyed these papers so much. Such a great start to the conference. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if uh, the panel has any thoughts about how gender plays into all of this, because, I mean, women's lives are fragments uh, in, in the archives, um, not documented properly. And um, she kind of talks about this um, woman who comes to life in a fragment um, in Stella's paper. And then I was wondering if, um, regarding Jane's paper, hello Jane, um, uh, that, um, you know, whether afterlife has something to do with women who haven't had full lives and therefore need to be reanimated. So I just wondered what your thoughts were on, on gender and how you were uh, talking about fragments and lives. Can I leave you and answer that one? Uh, can you hear me? Because I had a glitch a minute ago. Good, okay. Um, I'm thinking very much with um, Back to, to the Lighthouse and um, Wolf sort of trying to recall her mother through Mrs. Ramsey. Um, and I suppose the question that her mother, because she hadn't done anything sort of famous and out there, had become lost and forgotten. And of course, in Leslie Stevens' writing, you know, he talks about 
Julia and talks about, you know, and in fact quoting Wordsworth about the little unremembered acts of kindness and love. I think that's how the phrase goes. So there is this sort of attempt to, it's harder to sort of rescue women who haven't got that sort of trace uh, out in the historical record. And I think Wolf is very sort of concerned about that and very concerned to sort of, uh, in her writing, and therefore um, fiction and the imagination takes over some of that in order to sort of remember her mother. So I think in a certain way, what Wolf is doing in To the Lighthouse particularly is a sort of challenge to, to Leslie Stephen, to, to Wordsworth, to the sort of whole male uh, idea of, of, of what makes someone memorable. Yeah. Okay, so we might as well, I don't know what uh, fellow panelists think. Yeah, Stella. Um, yeah, I think that's a, it's a really interesting question. And I, I agree, Varsha, that, uh, you know, it's, women's lives are likely to need resuscitation in more, in more instances. Um, you know, one of the things that I didn't get a chance to talk about in, when, you, when you read these, uh, this criticism on the, the common reader's role in kind of, you know, be, paying faithful attention to things that others might have overlooked is that I think that, you know, let's take the example in, is it chapter three of, of A Room of One's Own where, where Wolf kind of explores the many creative women in the 17th and 18th centuries who, you know, scribbled their their works or, or thought themselves crazy or, um, you know, had to write, but could not necessarily have made themselves understood. Um, so she, she, I think, is very attentive to, to the relationship between gender and a fragmented work that, that never reaches a published form. Um, the other thing that I, that I think you know, both critics are interested in is the, is the idea of a fragment, the appeal of a fragment to a common reader because it can be imaginatively completed. And that also, I think, would apply to the kind of, you know, assorted, assorted diary entries or unpublished, you know, writ, uh, memoirs or, or, uh, or, or letters or partially finished novels. And Dane in, in this essay, which as you can tell from the, what I did say about it is entirely devoted to uh, different ideas about and definitions of, she really kind of delights in proliferating definitions of the fragment. Fragment, she like Wolf in, um, in the portrait of, or the, the silhouette of Mrs. Edgeworth, you know, explicitly kind of says, well, this is something that readers can imaginatively complete. So I think that, um, it's a very kind of optimistic literary concept, isn't it? Because it can it can bring back those those unpublished uh, bits of literature. I have a few. No, go oh, ahead. Sorry, do go ahead, Emily. Uh, I have a few brief thoughts on obscurity and women, but but, but I'll I'll just say. Um, Quickly, one is there's a tension in Wolf's work between interest in the lives of the obscure and the um, the interest in the writing of the obscure. And of course, in her own life, she's very interested in anonymity and often dislikes that her face that she's, let's say, photographed. I dislike my face hoisted about by the math, something like that. When she, after she's photographed by Giselle Freund, she she wants her work to be known, but she doesn't want her face to be known. She doesn't want her life to be known. Um, so when we talk about uh, resurrecting someone, whether it's a, a woman or anyone, there 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 is a question of what it is we are resurrecting. Is it is it the life which perhaps um, that person might have wanted to keep private, uh, or is it the work which presumably the person might have wanted to be better known? Um, Another question uh, here is whether when we're interested in um, someone obscure, we're looking to them as an individual or as representative. Often when we try to resurrect someone, we're trying to make a larger story out of it. Look how they represent this whole type of voice that has been forgotten to history. Um, but in the process of making them representative, do we obscure their individuality? Um, that's another tension. Um, and here I just want to cite, uh, uh, these are not thoughts original to me. They are thoughts I read recently in an essay by Alison Light, 
um, whom you, you'll all know as the author of Mrs. Wolf and the Servants, but she has a new book out called Inside History um, that came out in the fall with Edinburgh. And she has an essay there called Lives of the Obscure. And she, of course she quotes Wolf, but, and she talks about researching her own family, uh, her own family background. Um, and she, she draws out some of these tensions uh, and I, I'm, I'm synthesizing her here. Thank, thank you, Emily. I think the other thing I was going to add into this discussion when you were talking, especially lives of obscurism and be life versus writing, is Judith Shakespeare, of course, who didn't exist at all. But Wolf at the end of Room of One's Own is sort of saying, we can make her exist, you know, we can bring her back um, as women writers. So I think that's quite an interesting tension as well, really, that um, it's it's a yeah, a writer who never e existed but that the imaginative effort of current day women writers can make, you know, bring into the present and make exist. I just wanted to <clears throat> enter in <clears throat> an observation um, in the chat from Laura um, about, uh, you know, sort of the, the later wolf and ways in which the fragment kind of appears in between the acts, a kind of replay of the fragments of Wolf's own work as she's sort of uh, reaching the end of her life. Um, Laura, do you want to sort of speak to that? I think there's a, a really interesting sort of question about Wolf's relationship to fragments and even imagining her own fragmentariness there. Yes, thanks. Well, first, I wanted to thank everyone for the for the reflections so far. And especially, I wanted to thank Emily for uh, signaling this new book by Alison Light. I'm very curious. And, uh, and also, um, I wanted to thank Emily for bringing up this idea of the, the life and the work, what is being reconstructed. Um, and I'm going to kind of use this as a, uh, as a prop to uh, signal that we're going to have um, a round table on um, biography, biofiction, and ethics um, related to Wolf and the Bloomsbury Circle um, on uh, Saturday. So stay tuned. Uh, okay, enough. enough uh, but I, no, really, this the, what you said about what is being reconstructed, what is worth being reconstructed, is probably at the at the core of what we'll we will be discussing on Saturday. Um, and yes. Um, yeah, uh, uh, this this reflection on late wolf was basically triggered by uh, what uh, Stella and uh, Jane were saying about um, the uh, the fragment as not just a, not just something that remains and is like precious the precious fragment, but also as a point of departure. Like, how do we assemble the fragments back? And I think Yeats's uh, wonderful uh, final stanza from the circle, Circus Animals Desertion uh, really sums this up because it is, uh, it's so the, the final lines, I must lie down where all the ladders start in the foul rag and bone shop of the heart is basically summarizing the, the poet's endeavor of, of having to come to the basics and the basics are always fragmented and the heart is always fragmented and um, uh, one is always uh, trying to build uh, those masterful images because complete as Yeats calls them uh, but the the building blocks are always fragments and um, and reality always comes to us in in a sort of torn and fragmented way um, and reflecting on these fragments, I think, is important. It's an important part of these writers' late style. So, of course, this is Yeats reflecting on his his uh, po poetic uh, career. And similarly, I think Wolf in Between the Acts goes back to her image as a writer and uh, and plays with it as uh, in the form of the of the play that the that the Ms. Latrobe is setting up and it's just it, it's a way of taking distance from oneself through the fragment one takes distance from the the image right in into the lighthouse the the image that comes to fruition and she had had her vision right the image that is complete and full and puts it into perspective so yeah, I think I think the fragment can be both a, a an endpoint and the beginning. 
So yeah, this was this was my reflection. But thank you so much for the papers. Uh, thank you, Laura. I, I, it's hard to see if my fellow panelists are responding or not. Um, but I was going to say, yeah, thank you. I love that idea. And Pat Lawrence put something in the chat about mirrors. And I, when you were talking, Laura, I was thinking of the mirror scene when it's all those bits and pieces of shiny objects. So it's not one complete image. It is a kind of fragmented image. I think Wolf is allowing the fragments to, to sit there and, and to kind of speak to one another or to to clash. And, and I think, yeah, that is absolutely characteristic of her late style. Um, and a couple of other thoughts there when you're talking there about the arts frags and uh, scraps and fragments, which has been quoted in the chat as well. Um, that Wolf uses in between the acts is also a phrase from Wordsworth. So it kind of ties our, our papers together and the, the leech gatherer who's, I think it says, is kind of gathering his bits and pieces of, of detritus really together. So that's quite an interesting connection between the papers. But I was also thinking of the fragment um, when you were talking Stella about the fragment being something that then sort of takes off and inspires the imagination. And I think the work of um, Stephanie Polzell, who talks about Wolf and um, Lecture Divina, which is a, a spiritual practice of taking a, a short phrase and reflecting on it and where that takes you. And I think Wolf, in some ways, she uses the fragment in, in, a, in very much that way, really, a fragment that sets off an idea that sets off new images. So, yeah, just a few, a few ideas <laughs> to throw in there in response to that wonderful comment. Uh, uh, Laura, thank you. It's so many interesting directions of the fragment. Jane, could you could you spell that that spiritual practice that you just were talking about? I'll put it in the chat. Oh, you did. Okay, sorry. No, I will. I, I will. have to scroll down. Oh, you will. Okay, right. Isn't it, Jane? Isn't it also? I'm trying to look up the leech gatherer and failing to find it quickly. But isn't it Troilus and Cressida at least also scraps? Oh yes, it is also yes, yes. So it's a double. It's a double link. Okay. Yes, and that happens an awful lot in Wolf as well, isn't it? That she quotes something which is actually also quoted from something else. You Going know. already. Yes. Scraps or it's yeah. in fragments of her of her greasy love or something. It's about unfaithful yeah. interests in Cressida. Yeah. Yes. Got caught up in recording my 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 own notes. Um, derelict of duty as uh, as panel chair. Are there any um, last questions? We've got like a minute left, but we can you know saturate that minute. Well, thanks everyone so much. This was a fantastic panel and my mind is just bursting with ideas that maybe <laughs> um, arguably are still in fragmentary form. Um, but what a fantastic way to kick off the conference. This well, many thanks to the audience and to the fellow panelists. You're all with such, such great questions. I, I have m much food for further thought. Yeah, thank, thank you, you too. Everyone. Thank you. It's great papers, everybody. Thank you for kicking us off. Um, really thought provoking, wonderful stuff.